La Trobe University is proud to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and we pay our respects to their elders past and present. And I'm very pleased to welcome you to our debate on responding to China's rise. My name is Nick Bisley and I'm the Executive Director of La Trobe Asia. And tonight's program has been a collaboration between my team and Professor Robert Mann's Ideas and Society program. In the span of little over a generation, China has been transformed. In the mid-1970s, it was an insular, isolated country that was barely able to feed its own population. This was perhaps nowhere more visible than in the parts of China that bordered the then crown colony of Hong Kong. To travel on what was then called the Kowloon Canton Railroad was to journey not just from a vibrant capitalist entrepot to an autarkic communist power, it was to travel back in time. From a bustling global city, one moves swiftly to a rural environment barely touched by the 20th century. Yet today, the difference between Hong Kong, now a special, a special administrative zone of the PRC, and its neighbor, Shenzhen, is hard to discern. Its lights, wealth, and global connections increasingly a match for the harbor city. This change is emblematic of what has been the greatest story in human development history. Never have so many people had their life chances improved as rapidly as this. The statistics are well known. China is the world's second largest economy in overall terms and has been its largest for some time if you account for differences in purchasing power. It is at the hub of global production chains. It's the world's largest producer of cement and steel. And it sits on the world's largest foreign reserves, has the world's second largest number of billionaires, an irony given its one-party authoritarian political system has an ostensibly communist purpose. And of course, it has the world's second largest defense budget. When one sets this alongside its demographic, geographic, and civilizational legacies, the implications are quite staggering. So how should we respond to this epochal development? Will China's return as one of the world's most important powers conform to the timeless rhythm of world politics, which for some entails the endless rise and fall of great powers punctuated by rivalry and conflict? Or does the fact that China is bound to the US and its many allies and partners through complex webs of trade and investment mean that this time things will be different? Have we finally learnt the lesson that rivalry and war are fundamentally counterproductive ways of conducting human affairs? China is a country unlike any other. Its re-emergence has already had a gravitational effect on the global economy and world politics. But it is wrong to take that metaphor too literally. How countries respond to China's rise will determine the kind of world in which we will live. The purpose of this evening's discussion is to debate these issues. And we are very fortunate to have three of the world's preeminent experts on this question lead our discussion. I'll briefly introduce them and then explain our structure. Sitting to my right, uh, Hugh White is Professor of Strategic Studies at the Australian National University, where he was previously the Director of the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, which this year celebrates its 50th anniversary. Many of you will also be aware that Hugh is the author of the influential, and for some controversial, China Choice, Why the US Should Share Power, published by Black Ink. To my immediate right, Linda Jakobsen is the founding director of China Matters, a not-for-profit policy organization focused on the Australia-China relationship. Linda is also a visiting, for, uh, visiting professor at the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, and is a member of the La Trobe Asia Advisory Board. Linda is also the author, along with Bates Gill, of China Matters, Getting It Right for Australia, which is a book to be published in the new year, one of the first of the new La Trobe University Press publications. Uh, Robert Mann was to be our third speaker. However, due to ill health, he's unable to join the panel this evening. But we're extremely grateful that John Fitzgerald has been able to step in. Uh, John is Truby and Florence Williams Chair of Social Investment and Philanthropy at Swinburne University. And he's also currently the president of the Australian Academy of Humanities, sorry, of the Humanities. Uh, and John has previously held positions at the Ford Foundation in China and, of course, at La Trobe University. So the discussion will be organised as follows. Hugh and then Linda will each speak for 20 minutes. Uh, John will then speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and then I will open things up for questions, discussion, comment and debate. Hugh, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much, Nick. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to share the platform with Linda and John, both of whom I should make clear at the outset know a lot more about China than I do. And uh, 
and I'd also like to register my thanks to Rob Mann for helping to make this happen and uh, sorry he can't be with us here tonight and also to thank the Latrobe team for putting this together. It's a pleasure to work with uh, professionals on the organisational side. So the rise of China, it's a very big story. As Nick has said, it's probably the biggest story in the world today. It's one of the biggest stories in international history. And it's got a lot of implications for Australia, including a lot of domestic implications. The sort of name State Grid and Sam Dastiari will remind you of some of those domestic issues. And they're very interesting questions, but I'm not going to talk about them tonight. I'm going to focus instead on the broader questions about how China's rise affects Australia's international environment and how Australia should respond to that. That is, I'm going to look at how China's role in the region is changing as China increasingly challenges what the Australian government in its last defence white paper called on 56 separate occasions the rules-based global order. And without getting all scholarly on you here, by, by rules-based order, I mean something pretty simple. That is a set of rules, expectations, assumptions about the way countries interact with one another, which sort of define the rules of the road. It's what makes Asia today, the fact that we have a stable and strong order in Asia today, is what makes Asia today different from Asia in the 1930s or the 1940s or the 1950s or the 1960s. Um, so, although it's a bit intangible, it's, it's very real and it's very important. And to cut a long story short, I think it's pretty clear that China today is challenging the present order in Asia. It wants to either ignore the rules or change them, or a bit of both. Um, so what's, how does Australia respond to this? And we've seen this challenge, of course, it, most obviously, I guess, in the South China Sea, but I think that's, in a sense, just the tip of the iceberg or a symptom of a deeper phenomenon. Um, so Australia's approach to this hitherto has been, as Chinese interlocutors often say, clear and consistent. There is a robust bipartisan view on both sides of Australian politics about how we should respond to China's challenge to the regional order, and that is to resist it. To resist China's challenge, to refuse to accommodate. And to do this by relying on the United States to orchestrate and lead a diplomatic campaign to persuade China to back off, to persuade China that it shouldn't challenge the rules-based order. It should accept that order, and with it, because this is what the, the phrase rules-based order really means in this context, with it except American strategic leadership, American primacy in Asia. And Australia's policy is not just limited to hoping the United States will lead a diplomatic campaign. It also has a military element. Australian governments have, in a way, up to a point, shown themselves willing to contemplate the use, or at least threatening the use, of force to compel China if it fails to back off. That's what, I think that is the only natural interpretation of some elements of the government's diplomacy over the South China Sea issue in recent months has been. And it's also quite clearly the import of the 2016 White Paper and to some extent the two White Papers that preceded it, Defence White Papers I mean, in 2009 and 2013, where uh, those documents clearly foreshadowed that Australia would expand its military and particularly its maritime capabilities, especially submarines and major surface combatants, in order to provide us with the wherewithal to support the United States in resisting China's challenge to the regional order if that should be necessary. So, and this is again a bipartisan point, seems to me, across both sides of politics. Um, and so we're not just talking about a diplomatic campaign, we're talking about a diplomatic campaign um, supported by at least the th suggestions of the threat of force. Now I think at the heart of that bipartisan approach is an assumption that this is going to be easy. That is an assumption that China will indeed back off and back off soon. Um, and, there, and in particular that it'll back off before we have to apply too much pressure and before we have to decide how much it costs us to, do, to apply that pressure and therefore before we have to make any hard choices about how hard we're prepared to push. 
that's why Australian political leaders on both sides of politics continually say we don't have to choose between America and China. We don't have to choose, they say, they think, because they assume that China will back off and accept US primacy as a foundation for the Asian order without us having to do anything too hard. Well, just to be absolutely clear, I really hope this policy works. <laughs> I, like, I would like the outcome. I love US primacy. It's been terrifically good for Australia. I love the rules-based order in Asia which it's supported. It's given us the 40 best years in Asia's long history. And if it could last forever, no one would be happier than me. But wishes don't make policy. The question is, will it work? At, and, and if it works, at what cost? What kind of choices will we have to have made? Now, I think the most striking thing about Australian policy towards China today is that nobody seriously asks that question. So I'm going to answer, ask it tonight, and I'm going to give you an answer. And there are five elements to the answer. That whether it's true or false, whether China will back off before we have to push too hard depends on five things. The first is, of course, China's power and resolve. How serious is it? about challenging the regional order and how hard can it push. Big subject, I'm gonna be quick here. Let's start with China's power. China is the world's second biggest economy today, or biggest on one measure, as Nick said. And it's continuing to grow for an economy of that size astonishingly fast. It's slowing, of course, but it's not failing. It will, in all probability, 95% probability, overtake the United States to become the biggest economy in the world and keep growing faster than the United States after that. And that makes a big difference because wealth is power. If you doubt that, ask yourself, which was the most powerful country in the world in the 19th century and which was the richest? Britain, in case you don't know your history. Which was the most powerful country in the world in the 20th century, and which was the richest? America. So there's a fairly strong correlation, just straight off the pin, between wealth and power. If China is, as I think it's very likely to be, the world's wealthiest country in the 21st century, it's very likely to be the most powerful. And even if it's not, in terms of its capacity to challenge the United States, it's worth bearing in mind that its economy today is twice as large relative to America's as the Soviet Union's ever was at the height of the Cold War. Twice as large. And the Soviet Union was powerful enough in the Cold War to give the United States a very serious run for its money. Militarily, China is not the equal of the United States in aggregate military capability, but it doesn't need to be. It has the capacity, it already has the capacity to raise the cost to the United States of the United States' own military operations in the Western Pacific far higher than they've ever been before. Uh, high enough to change America's strategic calculations. And its economic scale, which makes it the most important source of economic opportunities for every country in Asia, gives it immense diplomatic weight. You better believe that. If, 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 you, if you don't think that economic power translates into diplomatic weight, you should drop into the cabinet room someday and listen to how they talk about it. So it's got a lot of power and it's got a lot of resolve. China has accepted American leadership in the decades after 1972. But as my son used to say to me when he was younger, that was then, this is now. Things have changed. China is no longer a desperately poor country. It approaches the questions of its future status with a very deep sense of a remarkable history, a very deep sense of what it regards, rightly or wrongly, but that doesn't matter. What matters is what they think as a century or two of bitter humil humiliation, mostly at the hands of white guys like us. <coughs> Uh, with a very strong sense of achievement of the last few decades and with cautious optimism about its future.
I think it would be remarkable for us to expect China not to be extremely serious about building what Xi Jinping calls a new model of great power relations. If it's not, it is unlike any rising power in history. No rising power in history has ever res refrained from trying to expand substantially its leadership role in the strategic system in, in which it works, except post-war Japan. And I don't think it's going to follow that example. So I would say we would be very unwise not to expect that China is as willing or more willing to change the regional order as we are, we in the United States, are to preserve it. We should not doubt the depth of China's resolve. US power and resolve, also a complex question. This is a second issue. How, how serious is America about preserving the rules-based order? Well, the United States is not in decline, at least in any absolute sense. Its economy is doing pretty well, actually. But relatively, relatively, it is. It's, it's, as China's economy grows, as other elements of Chinese power grow, the position of unchallengeable primacy, which America appeared to have achieved at the end of the Cold War, has been very significantly eroded. So America remains a very strong country, an immensely strong country, but it's not as strong as they thought it, thought it is, and it's not as strong as we in Australia have thought it is. And it is in denial about this. No American political leader has ever stood up and said, told Americans, that their country is no longer going to have the world's strongest economy, for example. And militarily, uh, it's, not, it's not as omnipotent as many Americans and many of the rest of us assumed. It still has extraordinary military power, but it can't cheaply win against major regional adversaries in their own regions, against Russia in the Ukraine, or against China in the East China Sea or the South China Sea. And it too has to be extremely careful of the economic costs of confrontation. As for resolve, well, let's wait till next Wednesday our time to see what that is. I mean, this is a big subject, but, but um, let me put it briefly. The United States at the end of the Cold War um, coalesced around a vision of America's leadership role, which was that it could lead the world at low cost because it had such a vast reservoir of power of its own. It was so strongly superior to everybody else in every measure of national power and that uh, er no and nobody else would seriously try and oppose it. Everyone else would sign on to the American vision. It was only a decade ago that George W. Bush said words to the effect of, there is only one universally valid model for a successful economy in the 21st century, and it's America's. That was heroic. In fact, if you look at what's happened to that vision of the US role, and I might say, just to be clear, I regret this, I would like a world in which the United States was a leading, was a leading power because for all their teeny faults, um, I'd rather have them in charge than anybody else. But the fact is it hasn't worked out that way. The fact is if we look across the things that America's tried to do strategically over the last 15 years, let's just mention Iraq and Afghanistan and North Korea and Iraq and peace between Israel and the Palestinians and keeping the Russians in a box and containing China. Those are the key strategic objectives that the success of American presidents have set for the United States and they've all failed including, I would say, Iran, and it's a separate issue, but they've all failed. Now, the elites, the Beltway guys, still believe in that vision. And you can you know, read all about it in Foreign Affairs, uh, the Foreign Affairs Journal any day. But the voters don't. Just as the voters no longer buy what the elites tell them about the American economy, they no longer buy what the, what the elites tell them about America's role in the world. And that's why they might vote for Bernie. That's why they nearly voted for Bernie Sanders in the primaries. That's why they might vote for Trump, uh, or one of the reasons they might vote for Trump on next Tuesday. And it's also reflected in Obama himself, who as president has been a, a more notable dissident from the orthodoxy of US foreign policy 
than any president in a very long time. And that's why the pivot to Asia, which has been Obama's signature strategic policy, has itself been so timid. Obama too hopes that China will back off, but hopes it'll back off without having to be pushed too hard because he and the people around him are very unsure of America's willingness to push back any harder. And you can see that showing up in the atmospherics around the South China Sea issue in the last few months, but also in the administration's, successive administration's refusal actually to acknowledge that China is really a strategic rival, where it's perfectly obvious that it is. That's the second factor. The third factor are what other countries think. So there's China's power and resolve, there's America's China resolve, but what about the rest of us? Well, the model that Australian governments have, and oppositions have supported so vi vigorously presupposes that as China's power grows, all the countries in Asia cling closer and closer to the United States because they get scareder and scareder of China, and that strengthens America's position and makes it easier for the United States to lead that coalition to push back against China. And the trick about that is that it's half true. That is, people in Asia, elsewhere in Asia, are worried about China's growing power. They don't want to live under China's shadow. But they don't want to sign up for a harsh escalating rivalry between the US and China. And most people in Asia, I believe, are much less confident than we are that China is going to back off. And there are some interesting, spectacular recent examples. Uh, President Duterte of the Philippines, perhaps being the most spectacular, Prime Minister Najib of Malaysia, who I think is in Beijing as we speak. But also, if you want, so to speak, a more sober take on this, read the speech that Singapore's Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong gave in the Australian Parliament last month. His comments about the, the relations with China were extremely measured. This is not a guy who's signing up his country to support the United States in pushing China back into a box. Far from it. And of course the other example is Australia, because notwithstanding the policy I've described, Australia is very cautious about how hard we push back against China. We're very reluctant to find ourselves endangering our relationship with China in order to preserve the rules-based global order despite the policy that I've articulated. So yes, other countries are worried, but they're not worried enough to provide the United States with the supports it needs to make the policy that Australia is committing itself to uh, a very sure bet of success. So fourth point, what are the costs and risks of this approach? What happens if it doesn't work? And in particular, what are the risks of confrontation? One of the differences between my analysis of this issue and most others is that I take more seriously the risk of war. Um, and a lot of people find that odd because I think, surely, people aren't that dumb. I mean, how could this possibly come to war? Why would that be in anyone's interest? Well, it wouldn't be, just for the record. But that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Anyone who's very confident that escalating rivalry between the US and China over who is the leader of the Asian order will not result in war must be very confident that one side or the other is going to back off. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, who are you expecting to back off? Is it America that's going to back down or China? Either of them could, of course. But if neither of them does, then that's how wars start. That's what happened in 1914. Um, and if we think, as the Australian government apparently does, that we're willing to fight, that's why we're building the submarines, isn't it? Then why should we assume that the Chinese aren't if their resolve is just as strong as ours? And just to be clear, if a war does start, it's not going to be short, and we're not going to win it. I don't just mean we Australia, we the United States, we won't lose it. It will be very inconclusive, and it could easily escalate. So I think there's a real, that we have, when we think about this thing, the fourth factor we need to bear in mind is that there's a real risk um, of war, not, not a certainty by any means, but a real risk, and a risk we have to take very seriously. And the fifth point, of course, then, is, well, how bad would it be if China does change the order, 
how bad would it be if we do accommodate China and give it some space? Well, one, a very important part of the answer to that is we don't know. We don't really know what China wants. We don't know what they want now, and we don't know what they'd want if they found themselves with more power. So it's risky. It's very risky. And we'd have to sacrifice some things we value. We'd have to sacrifice some of the things we call values in order to uh, accommodate China rather than resisting it. Uh, but it is worth bearing in mind that if we don't, we are setting ourselves, ourselves on a path in which we're either assuming China's going to back off or we're deciding we're willing to fight a war over it. And you do have to ask yourself, would the kind of concessions we'd have to make in order to avoid that kind of escalating rivalry be so bad that it'd be better to fight a war with China, which we can't win, to avoid it? Well, values are important, but I just remind you that peace is a value too. So when I look at those five factors, I reach a pretty gloomy conclusion. Australia's current response to China's position internationally in, reg in the region is not going to work. It, it generates an escalating risk of strategic rivalry um, or, one of two outcomes, escalating rivalry and perhaps conflict avoided only by the United States deciding to withdraw from Asia, which I think is a clear possibility when we look at what's happening in the United States today. So what's the alternative, very briefly? First thing we have to do, our political leaders have to do, is to stop pretending to Australian voters that there is not a problem. I don't think our political leaders believe this, believe this themselves. They don't speak in private as they do in public. They don't really assume that the United States and China are just getting on fine. They know this is a really serious power political rivalry the outcome of which is far from clear and which is fundamental to our future but they are not courageous enough to explain that to the Australian public. So that's the first thing we need to do. The second thing we need to do is to stop hoping that China will just back off. We need to recognise the power and resolve behind China's challenge, whether we like it or not. The third thing we have to do is to start asking ourselves what, from our point of view, an accommodation might look like and what might be acceptable and what, what might not. The answer, no way, is not going to get us very far. So we better start thinking, well, what, what, is there a deal to be done here? A and the fourth thing is to start engaging the United States in a dialogue about what role the United States might realistically play in Asia. The United States will not be able to dominate Asia in the future the way it has in the past. But we do definitely want the United States to continue to play a strong role in Asia. So a conversation with America about what that role might look like is very important. And Fifthly, to start building our own model of a regional order in which China does play a much bigger role and America plays a smaller role but still works as well as possible for Australia's future. J.M. Keynes once said that the hardest thing for anyone to really get their head around was the idea that the future will be significantly different from the past and I think we're suffering from that. We've lived with US primacy for so long and we've, and we've loved it so deeply, we find it impossible to imagine it's not going to be with us forever. And I think that's a big mistake. And this does change the nature of our foreign policy. Lucky countries don't really need a foreign policy because the world works well for them to keep them safe and prosperous. Unlucky countries have to work really hard to shape the international environment to support their security and prosperity. Australia has not always been a lucky country in this respect. At times in our history, we've worked really hard to shape our international environment, and by and large, we've done pretty well, which explains why we're a secure and prosperous country today. But we're not doing well this time. And when we see a country fail to acknowledge the scale of the challenges it faces and fail to address the choices it has to make about how to engage it, you see a country going through the steps which cause successful countries to falter and fail. Countries do falter and fail. It could happen to us if we don't get this right. Thank you.
Thank you, Nick. Um, thank you all for coming. Good evening. Um, I do want to especially thank Latrobe Asia's both Nick and Nyanne Hetheridge. Um, it's always a delight to work with them. A few years ago, Hugh White and I found ourselves on many a joint panel together uh, here in Australia, also abroad. But this evening, I think, is the first time when the organizers have specifically told us that they're pitching us against each other. Okay. So it is indeed a challenge, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion after we've both spoken. And it's always very good to have John Fitzgerald in our midst. Let me say from the start that I do not think that Australia needs to choose between the United States and China. So there is no China choice, in my view. Second, um, as was mentioned in the invitation to this event, Hugh has argued that the most prudent response for Washington and its allies, Australia included, is to relinquish its predominance and share power in Asia with China. I do not think that the new balance of power in Asia is going to be determined on the one hand by one side, the United States, making a clear cut decision um, that today is the day I will relinquish predominance, or by the other side, China, deciding that by such and such a date, China is going to become the predominant power. I also don't believe that the two sides can sit down and negotiate this, either the two of them together or with the help of others. I do indeed foresee a new balance of power emerging for many of the reasons which Hugh this evening has eloquently laid out for us. But I see this new balance of power emerging over a period of time, step by step, incrementally. In fact, I argue that it is happening every single day of the year. Right now, the United States is continuously accommodating China's rise, accommodating China's need to share power, accommodating China's desire to be a more dominant force in the Asia Pacific. Despite the fact that to many in Washington, probably most, that word accommodating is a dirty word, and they would find it quite shocking that I am using it in the way I'm doing at this moment. One can say that with the exception of Christmas Day and Chinese New Year, on every single day of the year, there are likely to be dozens and dozens of Chinese officials in Washington and dozens and dozens of American officials in Beijing negotiating issues not only of mutual interest, but also on issues which are contentious. These two countries have approximately 90 annual dialogues every year on a wide range of issues, including within the military domain, including many sensitive topics. They are, in fact, already now in the process of learning how to share power. But let me um, step back for a moment and elaborate a bit on this view. My starting point is that nothing in history is pre destined. I think here I do differ with Hugh. When the Harvard professor Graham Allison states that war between the United States and China is more likely than not, he bases his assertion on a study of 16 cases of rising and descending powers all between approximately the 16th century and the 1990s. Um, thanks to Allison and his colleagues at Harvard, we now hear people who ponder international relations um, talk about the Thucydides trap, referring to this Greek historian's metaphor that expresses the danger of what happens when a rising power challenges an established power. And Allison is very clear in his conclusion. He writes, however unimaginable conflict seems, however catastrophic the potential consequences for all actors, however deep the cultural empathy among the leaders, even blood relatives, and however economically interdependent states may be, none of these factors is sufficient to prevent war, not in 1914, 
and not today. Of course, we know that Alison is alluding to the outbreak of the First World War, uh, when despite the affection that the Kaiser of Germany had, not only for Great Britain, but also for his nephew, the English king, um, war did break out. So Alison, of course, is not alone. Several analysts, um, Hugh among them, have argued that a vibrant economic relationship is not going to save the China-US relationship. However, I argue that the robust, multi-layered, multifaceted interdependency between China and the United States today is simply not comparable to anything between England and Germany in the 1900s. First of all, the entire Asia Pacific is interdependent in a manner unprecedented in history. Secondly, US-China relations today have reached a level of stability and maturity which ties the knots, and knots in the plural, between the two countries even tighter than before. A high degree of maturity in the political relationship coupled with this strong economic interdependence and vibrant people-to-people -people ties are, in my view, key stabilizing factors, ones that can be expected to mitigate a possible derailing of the relationship. This situation will remain intact as long as astute leaders on both sides of the Pacific pursue their own country's strategic interests based on pragmatism. And as Hugh himself mentioned, peace is indeed one value. In other words, I do think leadership matters. I realize that we're on the cusp of the US elections. Um, I realize that the next US president could be Donald Trump, and I think we'll wait until the discussion period to talk about the prospect of a Trump presidency and the discussion that we're having today on the region. But back to my main argument. The United States and China have a mature political relationship. Now, what does that mean? I define that as a relationship in which policymakers on both sides are not only familiar with each other's stance on many contentious and diverse issues, but they also have a relatively sound understanding on each other's decision-making processes on who makes the decisions. In the words of um, Evan Medeiros, for example, the man who for most of the Obama two terms has been in charge of Asia relations, this is a resilient relationship. And I think this resilience is very important to avoid a breakdown of communication when a crisis erupts. We've seen in recent years many instances in which the maturity of this relationship has been acutely tested. Um, there's been especially two cases which have co could have caused genuine rifts, I think, in the relationship if they had been mishandled. Happy to elaborate on these later if needed. But to me, in both cases over the last four years, the way in which these crisis situations were defused underscores both the value and the importance that the governments on both sides place on the relationship. Put another way, these two countries are willing to go to great lengths to keep the relationship on track, and increasingly, they actually know how to do just that. There's a degree of familiarity between Chinese and American senior officials which really exists among officials from two countries, let alone two countries that call each other strategic competitors and possibly even rivals. I think most of us are not aware of the huge commitment that both sides continue to this day to make to ensure that government officials are well versed in the bilateral relationship. There are hundreds and hundreds of American and Chinese mid-level junior officials with language skills and in-country experience. Um, they constitute a wealth of policy-relevant knowledge and understanding of how the relationship works. Amid the mid-ranks of the Chinese Communist Party of China, there are today an increasing number 
of people who have graduated from U.S. universities. In other words, the next generation of Chinese leaders. Despite the rise in nationalist emotion in China, uh, American university education remains a coveted goal for many elites in China, but also for ordinary people. Um, the Chinese have, for the sixth year in a row, constituted the largest international student group in the United States, um, comprising about a third of all international students. Even military ties are starting to have a bit of substance. I think everyone remembers, anyone who's followed US-China relations, that whenever there was a crisis, military ties were the first to go. Well, that's no longer the case, and I think this reflects the changing dynamics in the relationship, as well as the maturity of the relationship. Um, for example, in 2015, despite the fact that there was great tension in the South China Sea over China building the artificial islands, the number of bilateral visits of officers and defense officials, joint exercises, educational exchanges between the two militaries actually increased for the sixth consecutive year. A couple of years ago, the Chinese and American militaries signed memorandums of understanding which were hailed as landmark agreements about mutual notification mechanisms on major military activities. And they also agreed on a code of safe conduct on naval and air military encounters. All of these new mechanisms are intended to help both sides deal with a situation when misunderstandings and misjudgments could lead to unintended consequences. And finally, trade and investment between the two countries um, is so phenomenal that no one could have imagined the state of affairs in 1972 when they formed diplomatic relations. I'm not going to go into detail. Everyone um, is aware of them. One can say that the two countries are intertwined economically and financially. Finally, then, to the global stage, um, Hugh did allude to this. These two powers need each other um, more than ever before because they have to together reduce the threat of extremist Islam, climate change they need to deal with, proliferation of weapons, Iran, Sudan, North Korea, and international piracy, just to mention a few of the many daunting global um, challenges. Now, I said in the beginning that leadership matters. For China and the United States to avoid conflict, leaders do, on both sides of the Pacific, have to remain intensely and constantly committed um, to crafting policies that will maintain stable ties. I think they need to be, as I say, forever vigilant about guiding public and elite attitudes in a way that will keep in check the inevitable obsessions and insecurity inherent in this relationship, which feeds into the domestic political scenes in both countries. I think domestic pressures and the urge to push back uh, is indeed going to be formidable. For example, in China, the elites and the public alike are absorbed with the notion that the United States is out to get us. In other words, the United States wants to hold China down. The United States wants to stop China from taking its place um, as the leader of the regional order. And in the United States, among elites, but also among the public. Um, there are similarly harmful notions how to maintain a stable relationship when it is dominated by suspicions that China is going to push the United States out of the Western Pacific and establish its own sphere of influence in the region. In both cases, I do admit these anxieties are not unfounded. The United States would indeed prefer to be the world's sole superpower. And as Hugh already mentioned, most countries in the region, Australia included, uh, would prefer that to continue to be the case. China, in turn, does not want the United States Navy on its doorstep. 
It is intent to never again be vulnerable. It is intent to never again suffer from a century of humiliation. China views control of its near seas as absolutely, fundamentally, strategically important. And China will, I think, achieve this goal step by step in the quite near future. There's not much short of war that the United States can do about it as China has decided it needs to secure this kind of buffer zone for itself in the maritime domain. The years to come, probably the decades to come, are going to be incredibly testing. To quote Hillary Clinton, we are in uncharted waters. Just because I do not see an inevitable clash between the United States and China, it does not mean that I don't think that we're going to witness extremely tense times. China will continue, I think, to coerce smaller neighbors when it doesn't get what it wants. The United States and others in the region, including Australia, will continue to push back against these coercive measures. I agree with you that so far the pushback has been quite gingerly and will probably continue to be. As for the freedom of navigation, I think many people often overlook the fact that China is as dependent on unimpeded sea lines of communication as everyone else in the region. They are utterly dependent on foreign trade. Now I acknowledge the risk of an accident or an incident at sea or in the air spiraling out of control and leading to what is called unintended consequences, even possibly a military clash. But at the same time, I would like to remind everyone that the United States is not going to allow the tensions in the South China Sea to completely hijack this pivotal relationship it has with China. We already know that this year, in two bilateral meetings, the US and Chinese presidents tacitly, not explicitly, but tacitly agreed that they are not going to let these tensions over disputed waters in the South China Sea to get out of hand. In other words, there's already been a kind of a quiet understanding that let's agree to disagree. American and Chinese leaders, indeed Australian leaders too, need to prepare their citizens to learn to assess the new power balances in a new manner. In public, they need to openly describe the daunting challenges that accompany the emergence of a new superpower in the regional power structure. We are going to have to find ways to accommodate the rise of China. I agree with Hugh White that the Australian political establishment hasn't even started to, in public, prepare Australians for the years ahead. This is an ongoing transformation. Um, the United States, China, every single nation in the region will have to continuously cope with this fluidity. Uh, Duterte's visit to Beijing a couple of weeks ago, last month, um, yeah, it was last month, um, and his lashing out at the United States and personally to President Obama um, are apt reminders of how unpredictable this situation is. There is no status quo. I think in both nations, leaders must acknowledge constraints on their own perceptions of exceptionalism, both in Washington, D.C. and in Beijing. They need to rethink their obsession about the centrality of primacy, because only by sharing power can peace, can stability be maintained. Um, I think leaders in both Beijing and Washington would do well if they would um, heed the words of a veteran US China observer, David Lampton, who last year wrote that the words accommodation and compromise should not be dirty words. In conclusion, let me just say a couple of words about Australia. I think Australia needs to put a lot more effort into understanding the nuances of US-China dynamics. 
Australia needs to understand better the rationale of Chinese strategic thinkers and Chinese policymakers, two different groups I note. Australia's alliance with the United States too often narrows the options for an independent Australian foreign policy. I would like to remind everyone about words uttered 40 years ago by Richard Wolcott, um, one of um, Australia's long-standing um, DFAT secretaries, among many other things. Australia must maintain an independent foreign policy within the framework of the alliance, he wrote 40 years ago. China's rise has really created completely new and unfamiliar pressures for the entire Australian foreign policy establishment. This demands from them a much more nuanced, forward-looking approach to balance um, the restraints imposed by the alliance relationship, as well as Australia's need to develop a much more deep and constructive relationship with China. And lastly, I think Australia, both the government and the people of Australia, need to do away with this very simplistic mindset that sees China only in economic terms and the United States only in security terms. This means avoiding this trap of black and white choices of exclusively partnering with the United States or exclusively partnering with China. Australian leaders do need to regularly emphasize to the public that both countries are critically important to both security and prosperity in this country. So I end with those words, there is no choice. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Latrobe Asia. <clears throat> Great to see Latrobe still at it. And of course, there's a new China Centre at Latrobe University, and I'd draw your attention to the work that it's doing, a wonderful new centre. <clears throat> I'd very much love to have heard Robert Mann present on this panel, um, and I wish him well. Um, <clears throat> I don't have the depth of intellectual history of Robert, but I have some understanding <clears throat> of some of the issues surrounding values uh, relating to the issue in front of us, how to respond to China's rise at the present time. <clears throat> I'll leave to Linda and to Hugh uh, questions of guns and diplomacy um, and choices. I won't go near those myself. <clears throat> Rather, I'd like to touch on history, if I may, because to draw on something Hugh said, if China presents a balance to the rules-based order, <clears throat> oh, sorry, a challenge to the rules-based order. The challenge it presents is one that's often based on historical claims. Mm -hmm. And so the question of history, how it's interpreted, how these claims are made, how they're contested and disputed, is a very important one. So in these few minutes, I'll just touch on... Yeah, there. Why? Yeah, that's better. <laughs> the PSP. All right. <laughs> touch on two historical claims that I think frame some of these big picture stories or big picture issues that we've been covering here in Australia. The first is this, the claim that China is a benign power working to recover its historical place in the regional global order. I draw that into question. The second claim is that Australia has no skin in the maritime territorial disputes based on historical claims in the region. <clears throat> I'd like to put these out there and contest both claims. You'll be familiar with the first, that China is a benign power simply recovering uh, its historical position. You'll be familiar with that with the work of uh, Malcolm Fraser in his book Dangerous Allies, published 2014, and more recently with comments from Paul Keating and Bob Carr in fact, it's our retired political leaders who seem to be leading this line of argument. <clears throat> but the way China conducts itself here in Australia is not how we would expect a benign power to behave. And I'd just draw your attention, since we don't have much time, to one issue that's attracted some attention in recent times. <clears throat> the attempt by China Radio International, 
and other arms uh, associated with the State Council and Propaganda Bureau seeking exclusive control over Chinese community media and com community organisations in this country under a united front policy. Now, a united front policy is designed for the prosecution of war. That's what it is. The united front policy that drives China's overseas Chinese policy, shall we say, <coughs> was derived uh, in the period of revolutionary war, the war against Japan, the war to overthrow the nationalist government, as I've said before, to tickle the soft underbelly of the enemy and bring them across. It's not a sign of a benign power working in China that it does so in the name of and through the agency of the United Front Department. <coughs> Second, the claim that Beijing is a benign power is often associated with the claim that China is not historically expansionist. This again is repeated by Malcolm Fraser and other leaders in support of the claim that China is not uh, an expansion, well, is, is benign. <coughs> it's simply untrue. China, of course, has a long history, but over the last 2,200 years, it's grown and shrunk by conquest, dynasty by dynasty, from a small territory straddling the Yellow River into the great continental state that it is today. We could give many examples, but just to take one, the immense territories of Xinjiang in Western China were invaded and incorporated into China in a brutal invasion in the 1750s. <clears throat> this is associated with the so-called Jungari genocide in which 500,000 Buddhists of the Jungari ethnic group were killed and uh, the remainder taken into slavery. The Jungari no longer exist as a people. <clears throat> but the conquest was undertaken at that time with understanding this was a recovery of lost territory. It wasn't. China had never incorporated that part of that vast Western territory uh, into the state, into the territorial state. <clears throat> now, if this kind of historical claim is made in advance of invasion, it's ours anyway, we're moving in to take it, it suggests a certain kind of logic supporting the claim that China is not expansionist. That is to say, it's only ever recovering, uh, in effect, uh, its historical place in some order that preordained the present one. Now this brings us to the dispute in the South China Sea. Now I'm not a maritime legal expert, <clears throat> but when it comes to China's claims on the South China Sea, these are historical, not legal. They rest on the claim that one way or the other, China has ruled these since time immemorial and it's time everybody recognized it and got out of the way. <clears throat> now let's try a little thought experiment at this point ask what other claims we might leave ourselves open to if we don't question these historical claims. Let me remind you, in his speech to the Australian Parliament in October 2003, President Hu Jintao said, and I quote, back in the 1420s, the expeditionary fleets of China's Ming Dynasty reached Australian shores. For centuries, the Chinese sailed across vast seas and settled down in what they called southern land or today is Australia. <clears throat> now this deep historical claim of initial naming and continuous contact since the 1420s of a land we now call Australia is very similar in nature to the one made for China's claim to the South China Sea, that merchant sailors along with state expeditionary forces sail these seas long before anybody else, certainly poor Europeans, and laid the foundation for a claim for maritime sovereignty over water today. <clears throat> now, could such a claim be extended to territorial waters? Could it be that when the Darwin lease runs out in 99 years, there's no need to release it? It was always part of China, as demonstrated by the occupation for the last 99 years. <clears throat> Once we shift from rules to history, anything goes. Now, the historical claim, let's just get this clear, that the expeditionary fleets of China's Ming Dynasty reached Australian shores in the 1420s is based on no historical documentation whatever or serious scholarship. It's based on a work of historical fiction written by Gavin Menzies called 1421, which asserted that Ming Dynasty Admiral Zheng He discovered America, New Zealand, Australia and much else beside. <clears throat> 
Now, the fabrication was exposed by an Australian historian, Jeff Wade, most notably on a Four Corners program in 2006. And yet, to the best of my knowledge, despite being exposed as false, as false President Hu Jintao's claim has neither been challenged nor denied in Parliament. Remember, this has been made by the President of China in the seat of Australian sovereignty. It stands as a matter of record, and no Chinese President is likely to retract it now that it's on Hansard. Beijing's historical claim to the South China Sea, I would suggest, is equally slim. To be sure, Chinese ships have been roaming the South China Seas for a long time, and the fabled Ming Admiral Zheng He, the primary subject of that book, <coughs> um, was one of them. But of course, he was from Persia. He's of Persian descent, and he was retracing routes that Persian uh, Muslim Islamic ships and traders had been tracing for eons before he and other China's traders came that way. If there are historical claims on the South China Sea, in short, they're unlikely to be China's. But to state that these claims are nonsensical, that have no basis in fact, counts for little. <clears throat> when it comes to historical claims, Beijing does not permit free and open critical inquiry on historical issues. And this is where we come to question of values. How do we challenge claims in a state that doesn't recognise the right to contest an historical case? Beijing makes bold claims, silences its own historical critics, draws on work of fiction where they help to sustain its claims, and denies visas to foreign historians who dare even to question them. And this is certainly the case of Xinjiang when 16 very eminent international historians published a reasonable book on the history of Xinjiang in 2004. They lost the right ever to go to China again, <clears throat> simply to question these claims that China has not conquered or does not have, uh, basically, to question the claim that China has an historical claim over a territory which is merely trying to recover um, is not open for, con uh, for contestation. So I'd suggest there's actually little about China, as a little that's benign about China as a rising power. And Australia does have a stake in the game, in the territorial dispute, given the claims that have been made, shall we say, over Australian territories. I too am deeply concerned about the possibility of war. I'm equally concerned, perhaps less so, about the cost of accommodation. But I think we need to be aware of what that cost is. We are dealing with a country um, which is not likely to resile, which is most unlikely to pull back, <coughs> and which doesn't adhere, shall we say, to the rules of the game, whether it comes to the rules-based order or to the way in which historical claims are normally made and contested. Thank you. Our uh, three speakers have not surprisingly res responded admirably to the prompt of how should we respond uh, to the rise of China. Hugh has spoken in large structural terms about the prospects for conflict. Linda has given us a textured analysis of the most important bilateral relationship uh, that is going to influence how one responds to China. And John has pulled back the cloth to look at the kind of country China is, or more precisely, the kind of political system it has become. Um, we have about half an hour or so for questions um, to our panel, uh, and I'm hoping also that they will contest one another's comments um, uh, during that time. So if, if you have a question to pose, please indicate in the usual manner. Please do make it a question, and please keep it short. Uh, doubtless there will be lots of uh, issues people want to pick at or topics um, that some of the speakers have just touched on, so try to give everyone as much opportunity as possible. So the bidding begins. Um, in the case that China and the US do go to war, what should Australia's position be? Should it be neutral? Should it ally with US, or should it ally with the China? Not, not mucking around there. Yep. <laughs> right in the big one. <laughs> you you, do you want, I think I'll that's just, it's firmly in your territory. All right, I'll start. Good, good question. I mean, a, a really good question. Um, of course, it does depend on the circumstances. Um, uh, it also depends on what you think the outcome would be. So let me unpack those separately. 
Uh, let's take the extreme case. If, um, if China were to invade Japan, a really, in other words, a really gross, gross violation of the most fundamental principles of the international order, then someone like I would say that the arguments were very strong for Australia to, to support the United States if the United States went to war to support Japan. Um, uh, but if the, if, if the cause of the war was that China had decided to take an example, not, not entirely at random, to build a military base on Scarborough Shoals, a couple of hundred nautical miles off Manila, um, which it sort of kind of threatened to do, um, and which the United States is kind of threatened to fight back if they do, then I would be much more cautious because it doesn't seem to me that that is, uh, although it's a, uh, a violation of important parts of, or parts of the international order, it's not a violation as gross and flagrant as an invasion of another sovereign state. So that's the first thing I'd have on the table. The second thing I'd have on the table is who's going to win? Because it's a, with the risk of sounding cynical, um, going to war for the right reasons is one thing, but being on the losing side is quite another. Um, and a very important part of my uh, analysis of that, which I touched on in my early remarks, is that I think the chances of a conflict between the US and China being resolved quickly in America's favour are very low. It's not that I think the Americans lose um, in any sort of very straightforward way, they just don't win. And they lose quite a lot of stuff along the way and so do the Chinese, and that means the chances that of, of an escalation, both in intensity of the conflict and in its geographical extent, are quite high. That's not what always happens, but it's usually what happens in that situation. Um, and uh, I think an Australian decision in the cases, for example, like Scarborough Shoals, I think Japan would be different because it's such an absolute, it would be such a shocking thing and, and not, let me say, at all on the horizon. But on uh, an issue like, the, you know, something in the South China Sea, um, one of the reasons why I think Australia should be extremely cautious, I don't think this war is going to end well. There's one thing to support the United States in, you know, trying to push Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait in 1991, and another thing to start a war which we won't win uh, and which we can't readily conclude and which could escalate to a nuclear exchange. Possible. So, complex question. Second question, what would we in fact do? It's not quite the question you ask, but it's, a, it's also an interesting question. Um, and here, you know, uh, men and women of goodwill will differ, but I'm going to put my bet on the table, and you'll all remember this if I get it wrong. Um, I, I am very confident that no Australian government would in fact be willing to go to war with, to, against China to support the United States on any issue other than an absolutely first order case of state on state aggression. We would not go to war with, the United, with China in support of the United States for any issue in the South China Sea, or for that matter, the East China Sea. I'll just put that on the table for fun. Linda. Uh, well, I'd just like to add a little bit of spice <laughs> <laughs> to that there wasn't um, enough. <laughs> question. Is Australia is the alliance partner of the United States. Um, Australia is obligated to fight alongside the United States. Um, so there isn't a choice when you ask would they, you know, choose the United States or China. As far as military alliances are concerned, Australia made its choice um, several, several decades ago. I agree with Hugh's assessment that it would depend on the circumstances. Um, and uh, just to throw in that extra bit of spice, Hugh gave us an example, this flagrant um, case of Japan being attacked or something with the rocks in the South China Sea. But what about Taiwan? I like to say that we forget Taiwan at our peril. Taiwan remains the most, Taiwan's unresolved political future remains the most important contentious issue between the United States and China. I, and, I agree with that. Um, we've had uh, 
lovely eight years of lulling us into thinking that these two, mainland China, Taiwan, are so intertwined economically, also people to people, by the way, that the problem has gone away. It hasn't gone away. The political future of Taiwan is unresolved. There, I think, Canberra would be very hard pressed because though they are committed, obviously, as alliance partners, and they would, I'm sure, facilitate intelligence and logistical support to the United States in such a situation, it would be a very touch and go situation how much they would commit um, to actually taking part in the conflict. It would depend entirely on how it was started. It could be the Taiwanese themselves would start the conflict. Then does Australia want to get involved? We don't know. It, it, it's a very, very complex situation if it's a question of Taiwan because of it's not such a clear cut example as the ones that you mentioned. A little product placement. We, in 2014, we published a small report on if there was a conflict in the East China Sea where the ANZUS would be uh, invoked. So you can download that on our website to find out. Authored by Brendan Taylor and Nick Bisley. I mean, I'll use the passive voice in the front here. And if you just show, I can start lining planes up like Heathrow. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is to Professor White. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Connor. I write with the World Socialist website. Um, I believe you referred in your contribution to a difference between what's being said in public on these issues and what's being said in private by politicians and also yeah. by the foreign policy and military elite. Yeah. Yeah. Can you elaborate on what is being said behind closed doors, specifically on the question of the likelihood of a war between the US and China and the use of nuclear weapons? Um, uh, it's a complex question, of course, because, you know, everybody has different views. The, the contrast I was trying to draw is between the very high level of complacency in Australian official statements. Uh, that is, uh, you know, Australia doesn't have to choose between America and China because the US and China are going to get on just fine. And what strikes me, and I don't want to misrepresent the quality of my data here, I'm really talking about a, a, a collective impression from a very wide range of conversations with a very wide range of people. Um, a, but a pretty steady set of conversations over many years is that I, I believe that, the, that in actual fact Australian political leaders are much more conscious of the seriousness of the strategic rivalry between the US and China than they have ever expressed publicly. Um, uh, and uh, uh, just to be clear, I don't say that they agree with me. They're not as gloomy about that trajectory as I am, uh, but they are m more gloomy than their, um, uh, than their public statements generally suggest. And it, I, I would add it's not only the Australian government which has this sort of dissonance between what they say in private and what they say in public. And America has never, Obama has made Asia policy the centrepiece of his foreign policy and has never given a single speech about it within the United States to explain no, right. what no, it no. is that no, the US is trying to do. He's given two big speeches on China, both in Australia. It tells you something. All right, I had one in the back and then one there, and then I'll start the list. To uh, Hugh White, where does the matter of nuclear deterrence and the rhetoric which backs up nuclear deterrence fit into the equation of the South China Sea and preventing? either aggression or a conflict breaking out there in the future? Ah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, big, big question. Um, to, to do justice to that, I'll just have to go back two steps and actually touch on something that Linda said. Very important, neither the United States or China want a war. They both want to achieve their objectives without a war and they both believe they can because they think the other's going to back off. This is a very common situation in history. So China, America wants to remain the dominant power in Asia and expects the Chinese will back off and allow it to do so. China wants to become the dominant power in Asia and expects the United States will back off. Um, and that's how it can be rational for them each to adopt what are highly incompatible policies while still maintaining, actually, as Linda says, a very complex, interactive conversational relationship. They expect to get on, they both expect to get on fine because they just think the other guy's going to give way. Um, now that situation can persist 
through a diplomatic confrontation and right into a conflict. So um, uh, it, when one talks to um, Americans about the, the scenario of a US-China conflict starting over something insignificant, well, well relatively insignificant, like uh, Scarborough Shoals say, um, uh, then there's a very strong tendency to believe that China would not in fact risk a military confrontation. That the Chinese would, be, if it push came to shove, if the Chinese became really convinced the United States was going to use force to, for example, stop China developing Scarborough Shoals, that the Chinese would back off because they, American believe, the Chinese know they couldn't win against the United States. I don't in fact think that is the Chinese view. And if I'm right and the Chinese are not sure that, they, that they'd lose, um, and indeed if the Chinese believe that the United States would back off, then both would step forward, not just from their contrasting diplomatic positions, but in, into an actual conventional conflict. And now I get to the answer to your question. The scary thing is that that mutual expectation that the other will back down will carry up through an escalating conventional conflict and up to the nuclear threshold. And one of the reasons why that's a real danger is that nobody knows where the nuclear threshold is. Um, this is one of the big differences between the, the situation in Asia today and the situation in Europe, for example, during the Cold War. The Cold War in Europe was bloody dangerous, and don't let anyone tell you it wasn't, but it had one thing going for it, and that is that everybody knew what the threshold was. It was very low. You didn't have to do much in Europe in the Cold War to start a nuclear war, but it was very clear what it was you had to do. If you started up your T-72 and drive it, drove it through Checkpoint Charlie, you were going to start a nuclear war. Uh, so very small, but very clear. It was geographically defined by a line down the middle of Europe to the nearest metre. But nobody knows Nobody knows what the equivalent line in East Asia is today. And I think there is a risk that in a conflict both sides, as it started to escalate, as I think it easily would, would find themselves worrying about what the other guy would do and start to, 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 to think, well, may, maybe I have to move first. Now, I won't, I won't talk you through the scenario because it does get pretty complicated and convoluted as nuclear strategy does, but I think the risk, although I think the risk of nuclear escalation is not high, not as high as it was in Europe as a Cold War, it's much higher than most people think because of the mutual underestimation of one another's resolve, which, and nobody made that mistake in a Cold War, and because of the unclarity of the threshold at which nuclear exchange might occur. One last sentence, if Nick will allow me. A very important part of the present order in Asia is the confidence that all of US allies in Asia have that the United States would be willing to fight a nuclear war against China in order to defend them, particularly if you're Japan. I think that confidence is misplaced. When I ask my American friends, what is there in Asia that you're willing to fight a nuclear war with China with, a nuclear war which might include nuclear attacks on US cities, the answer is nothing. Linda, quick. Just a small intervention um, because I think, Hugh, you're not taking into consideration the fact when you talk about both sides cannot read the others, and that's the danger of nuclear escalation. Um, you're not taking into consideration that factor which I spoke about, that today the two sides do know each other, understand each other, have ways of communicating with each other in a way which is unprecedented. Um, Yes, um, I disagree. Um, uh, I, I, um, it's a very important. It's a very important point. It, it, Linda is absolutely right. There is a phenomenal density of interaction. It seems to me there's surprisingly little serious strategic communication. A very important people can meet in very expensive rooms and drink very glamorous mineral water and still say nothing to one another of substance. And I, 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 I see very little evidence that the United States and China have had a serious discussion about their nuclear relationship. Unlike the United States and the Soviet Union, these guys really talk nuclear strategy with one another all the time. They told one another lies all the time, 
but they talked about it a lot. One of the problems, one of the things that reasonable, I think the nuclear factor is more worrying than it otherwise might be because, because Americans do not take China sufficiently seriously as a nuclear adversary. Because the poor guys have only got 400 nukes, and I mean, no serious nuclear power would make do with that few. I think there's a, so that's what, I, I don't think that dialogue has really got to grips with, with things. And, and the more I talk to American nuclear strategists about that, of course I've never had a serious conversation with a Chinese nuclear strategist about this, but the more I talk to American nuclear strategists about this, the more convinced of that I am. Okay, again. Um, yeah, how relevant is uh, military and economic um, primacy um, if it doesn't go with ideational primacy? And the question is, does China have enough ideational primacy to challenge the United States position, do you think? Or has it got any at all? Let's start with Linda. Yeah. Can, can it offer yeah. Yeah. a model to, yeah. to the world like the United States has done for the past 50 years? Uh, that's a really important question. Um, this question of um, ideational soft power is what we're talking about. The ability to appeal. Well, um, from a Western point of view, there's a lot about China which is not appealing. Um, John Fitzgerald has alluded to some of that um, in his remarks today. Uh, the one-party state, the one-party authoritarian political system of China is something that, for example, Australians will always have to grapple with when they um, think of their deepening and widening and broadening relationship with China. There's no doubt about it. But um, in many parts of the world, um, we have to remember that the model that China has given us of this rapid economic growth, um, maintaining of political stability at the same time, I mean, it has been a remarkable success story. That is very appealing. So I always remind myself um, when we think from our point of view that uh, the lack of the rule of law uh, gross social injustices, the political system that we don't agree with, that is not appealing. That does not give us soft power. But on the other side of the coin is the great appeal that in some people's eyes across the globe, the Chinese model has provided. Just briefly, I think China's um, soft power appeal in Africa and some parts of Latin America is very high. And it's not just to do with the China model, it's to do with the historical narrative of a country that had been subject to colonial oppression, <laughs> thrown off that yoke and risen up. And, and the idea that the West, particularly Europe, um, has an appalling colonial history in Africa um, cannot be denied. And China has an alternative narrative to build on that, an historical one, which has merit. In the front here. Uh, the question is about domestic policies. As all the foreign policies are formed by cabinet, so how could teaching Australian population about China will help Australia to respond to China rise? I think that's for you, Lynn. Yeah. Can you repeat that just one more time? Yeah. Um, as all the foreign policies are mostly formed by cabinet, mm -hmm. so how could teaching Australian population through political leaders uh, will help Australia to respond to China rise? I, if, if I understand the question, um, it has to do with, given that foreign policy is formed in okay. cabinet yeah. at the very highest levels, what is, what is the role of informing the Australian public around this and how is that reflected in the political system? Um, I, I'd just like to, if I may briefly respond, <coughs> that while foreign policy is set at that level, actual international relations and engagement are set at the people and people and institutional level to a very high degree. So when business, business, Australian businesses relate to Chinese business or take advantage of opportunities, they don't go through cabinet and some foreign policy framework. Similarly, universities, which have very intensive engagement with China, do so <coughs> of their own accord and initiative. <clears throat> and it's at that intermediate level that much of the education, I think, has value because, uh, in my view, um, the Australian middle management and leadership of Australian institutions have not been sufficiently aware of the challenges that China presents going forward. Um, and how that then reflects on the way in which a university or a business deals with China is critically important. And it seems to me there's some consciousness raising going on in China. It's critically important that Australia and China have 
friendly and cooperative relations. I think we all like that at a very high level. But on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, the way in which the relationship is conducted is by people who are participating in this conversation and just raising general awareness, as both our other speakers have said, is critically important for getting that right, getting the settings right. Yeah, that's really, can I just add one thought? I mean, I think that's exactly what John said, exactly right, but i just make one additional point. And that is that the cabinet room might be a windowless box behind about 18 feet of concrete. Um, but it's still surprisingly exposed to the Australian community because you walk out of the cabinet room and there's a line of television camera like that in front of you, um, if you're a minister. Um, and w when Australian cabinet ministers make decisions about their relationship with China, they all know they're making decisions that affect every single Australian, that the stakes for Australia are enormous. And so I don't think, uh, I'd, I think I don't think there's a the sense in which this is, so to speak, isolated from uh, from a broader public opinion. And indeed, one of the reasons why I think Australian political leaders on both sides of politics have been so reluctant to undertake the conversation I think we all think that they need to have with the Australian public is precisely because they know how much how much this matters to Australians in all different ways. I mean, and often in contradictory ways. So I think they're they're almost hypersensitive to how big an issue this is, and that's one of the reasons why they're reluctant to engage in it. Linda, do you I say, right there, there. Sorry, my English may not be very good, so I try my best to explain myself. Um, you mentioned before that China, uh, one of the problems that we, uh, we, we face is that if uh, we compromise or accommodate China's rise, then what do we still don't know? What do they want? What does that mean to our future life and our rights and our way of life and so on and so forth? And um, so what if we, we do know, what assuming that, um, that China has power over Australians like they have power over Vietnam, for example? Um, this is just a few examples that they can do in Vietnam. Um, environment destruction to the total massive scale, um, sea and forest, um, freedom of speech has been completely um, controlled and um, I mean that Vietnamese government is now dropping English as a subject in school and forcing primary school students to learn Chinese um, against the population's will and complaints and they now have tax free and all of their fruits and food products over the border um, despite the fact that the, gov the countries have been completely poisoned by the poisonous chemical fruits and um, insidious control of governments at many levels, um, not just the industry or anything, but a lot of um, and destroying the manuf manufacturing industries and all sorts of things. So assuming if that they have that level of control over Australians, just like they have the control over the Vietnamese, and actually, not to mention 4,000 boats gone missing since South China Sea has um, started. Um, and fishermen in Vietnam, thousands have died and been killed. Um, and they have lost their livelihood. Not just Vietnamese, but 500 million people sorry, living around. So we're, we're running so, with so, a lot and of sorry, people. My, my up, question so is, is if, you do, if, you do have, if you do have that knowledge, if you think that they're going to have that power over Australians, should we reconstruct our questions, um, not China versus America power, but Australians versus China, China versus everyone else's, their rights, their freedom of speech, and their life. I'll just briefly respond. I know that we're running out of time. Well, first of all, the question of how China will use its power is the biggest unknown in this entire discussion. That is the most profound question we are all facing. We do not know how in the future China will use its power. That's first one. And then secondly, um, I would say that some of the descriptions that you alluded to which pertain to Chinese and Vietnam, China, Vietnam relations um, aren't really applicable to Australia's relationship with China. Um, there are numerous instances that you referred to that I think the Australian um, public and government um, would simply not accept. Um, there are many reasons for that. Um, the, number one, Australia and China aren't neighbors. 
Um, for historical reasons, there is a certain dimension to the Chinese-Vietnamese relationship that doesn't exist between Australia and China and so on and so forth. Um, but the question of how China is going to use its power is really the biggest uncertainty of our times. Okay, one more. I think we've got time for one last one here. And I'm afraid I realize there's many of you who would like to ask questions, but we're, we're going to get booted out of here very swiftly. So, No worries. Well, um, no one's actually mentioned the Donald yet, so I thought I'd <laughs> ask a question. Yeah. Um, Donald. <laughs> um, given that um, his willingness to break with US foreign policy orthodoxy, well, at least ret rhetorically, um, where, was, where would Australia go should America in the future decide probably possibly quite rapidly to withdraw from Asia, engagement with Asia? Thinking the very, very thinkable an, Amer an, all right, an America under Trump and what it means. Um, firstly... One always has to remember that a US presidential candidate says many things about China, about the region, which then doesn't materialize. Um, of course, you can all now accuse me of wishful thinking. But um, at least <laughs> history tells us that they say many things that don't then pertain in reality. Um, the biggest question here is that Trump has said that he will basically um, unravel the basic structures of United States security in the Asia Pacific um, by um, putting pressure on both the Japan alliance and the South Korean alliance. Th this would have far-reaching consequences, not only for this region, but globally as well. Um, whether he would actually take those steps is unsure, it would certainly lead to a situation where both Japan and South Korea would want to ally, um, arm themselves, uh, probably want to also go nuclear. We're talking about a fundamental shift in Asian security. If any, even half of Trump's threats or promises, whichever you want to um, call them, uh, materialize. Um, and obviously, uh, his his, his policies will also have a big effect on Australia. The first effect it'll have is that uh, TPP, I think, will go, and Australia has been a big supporter of TPP. Hugh. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to say something a bit counterintuitive. I don't think it's going to make that much difference if Donald wins. Because I think the pressures that are against America continuing to play the same role in Asia as it's played hitherto are very strong and will affect any, whoever ends up as president. Donald will do it a little bit more erratically and unpredictably. Um, but Hillary Clinton too will face very strong pressures to, I would say, to, um, to, to, in, to commit less of America's wealth and blood and treasure and so on, energy, to supporting security in Asia than it has hitherto. America today faces in Asia a challenge more formidable than any challenge it's ever faced in Asia before because China's much stronger rival than it has before. America has never had the debate with itself as to whether its interests in Asia, not the paragraphs that they put in every speech, but its actual interests in Asia, are sufficiently important to warrant that kind of commitment. And of course, it's not just America's choice. What really matters is not just what America chooses to do, but what its allies choose as well. And if you're, if you're Japan or South Korea, you have to ask yourself a very serious question. Do we really believe any longer that the United States is going to do what it needs to do to defend us, to keep us safe from China? Uh, if, the Chinese and the, if the Japanese and the Koreans go nuclear, it won't be because of what Donald Trump says. It'll be a much broader judgment about whether the United States any longer has the resolve, and for that matter, the legitimate interests, to require it to preserve its whole policy. Linda's right, this will be a fundamental change in the strategic situation in Asia, but that's what we're seeing. That's what the rise of China is. So I, I think any, any, whoever ends up as president is gonna find it much, much harder to sustain the US posture than they have hitherto. Um, and that's why I think at the moment we face two very bad outcomes. One in which the United one in which is one of the ones the one in which I'm wrong, and in which the United States continues to to press China, continues to resist China's 
um, a challenge continues to do, in other words, what Australian governments hope they'll do, uh, which leads to escalating strategic rivalry. Um, uh, and the other is that the United States just steps back, not just one day, but progressively takes a series of decisions which cumulatively have the result the United States ceases to play a significant strategic role in Asia. That's a perfectly possible outcome. Now, the really interesting is what do we do then? Because we have never, since European settlement, lived on this continent without an Anglo-Saxon great power as a dominant maritime power in Asia. We don't know what our foreign policy looks like in those circumstances. So rather than take up too much time, I'll just say that in a quarterly essay I published a few years ago, I said that Australia has five options in that situation and none of them are attractive. But yeah. some are less unattractive yeah. than others. See my there, forthcoming there you book. Folks. There you have it, folks. Structure over agency. Uh, that, I'm afraid, brings us to an end. Uh, and. As you'll know, uh, events like this don't just magically happen. Uh, so I'd like to extend my thanks firstly to the Latrobe Asia team, um, in particular to our administrative maestro, Diana Heatherich, for her always outstanding work in making today such a great success. I'd also like to thank Robert Mann, uh, the Latrobe University Ideas and Societies Program, Ideas and Society Program, rather, and in particular, Pio Leovanag and Alicia Romanen, uh, as well as the excellent staff here at the SLV, who are always wonderful to work with. Um, I would particularly like to thank our panellists who have taken time out of the very packed diaries to be part of tonight's program and provide us with uh, such a rich discussion. So thank you, John, Linda and Hugh. Um, finally, uh, it remains to thank you, the audience, for being here on what is an unusually, in fact, surprisingly beautiful spring evening. Um, thanks for coming. <laughs>